Good afternoon and welcome to the cattle market situation and update webinar. Today's webinar is the first in a series of Outlook webinars that we are hosting in place of the Cancelled Rural Economic Outlook Conference. We will have additional Outlook webinars through February 2021. Today, Dr. Daryl Peel, OSU Extension Livestock Marketing Specialist, will discuss the cattle market outlook. This is a recording of the webinar that was canceled on October 27th. Dr. Peel, I'll turn it over to you now. Alrighty, well thank you Brent, I appreciate that. Thanks everyone for, uh, for joining us for this. Uh, yeah, let's take a little look at this uh, fed cattle market. It's been a pretty dynamic uh, situation here all year, but um, very recently for maybe some slightly different reasons. So we'll talk about that a little bit. By way of a little bit of overview, um, you know, we, I'm not going to talk about the first half of the year. It, you could spend a lot of time kind of going over. There's some really interesting things happen. Some of those were not interesting, good, or fun, um, but we learned a lot about markets and, and lots of dynamics. We're still dealing with some of the tales of those initial impacts uh, as we go forward. So, uh, you know, the second half of the year, we've been, uh, for example, trying to clean up uh, some of the fed cattle backlog that was created in the first half of the year. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in just a few minutes. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we are beginning to see after all of the turbulence of the first half of the year is we're finally starting to see these markets behave a little bit more typically. I put the word normal in quotes. I don't know what normal really means at this point. I think we're not quite to the, to the uh, place where we can think about what's going to be normal from now on. But we're beginning to see some of the more typical cattle market relationships between various classes of cattle, between cattle and beef markets. Uh, we're starting to see some of the seasonal patterns that we would expect to see uh, sort of begin to express themselves a little bit in these markets. So slowly, I think we are moving to something that we could uh, start to think about as some, some form of normal. Obviously, there's still lots of challenges. Uh, we are in a recession in the U.S. and globally. Uh, we haven't seen, frankly, in my view, as many impacts from that in cattle and beef markets as I might have expected, uh, but we're not done with this yet. And as we go into 2021, uh, we still got lots of concerns that really are going to come down through the demand side of the equation in terms of the, the macroeconomic impacts that we may have. Uh, you know, we're certainly not out of the woods yet on the public health issues of the pandemic. In fact, we may see a resurgence here during the winter. And so, uh, you know, I think this is anything but a, uh, a story with an ending yet. Uh, there's a lot to be determined going forward. That said, again, we've gotten through it to this point in some sense, uh, probably as good as, as you could really hope for. And uh, so we'll talk about that from a demand standpoint. The supply situation on the beef side in general, at least from a long-term cyclical standpoint, uh, will begin to be more and more supportive over the next few months to a year uh, and beyond. We're not massively liquidating cattle in any cyclical sense, but cattle numbers did peak in 2019. They're a little bit smaller here in 2020, and they'll get just a little bit smaller yet probably as we go into 2021. So overall, we're beginning to see some tightening, at least some general supportive uh, nature coming from that. Here's a graph that shows uh, steer prices in Oklahoma for three different weights. So the blue line is the uh, lightweight calves that we might be selling this fall, uh, or the lightweight stocker cattle that we might be trying to buy uh, if we have uh, you know, winter grazing potential. Then we've got a six weight, which is kind of a middle weight, uh, you know, feeder animal. And then we've got some heavy seven weight steers. And obviously we've been through lots of dynamics, particularly in the first half of the year. You can see that in general, we did see some recovery in these markets uh, after, uh, you know, in the second half of the year, really after June uh, to a limited degree. And of course, then as we got into the fall, uh, we sort of see the seasonal uh, typical pressure to some extent. Although you'll notice that those two bigger feeder cattle categories really dropped uh, on the far right side of this graph in the last couple of weeks. And, and uh, we'll talk about that relative to wheat pasture prospects, uh, which is really a key in, in Oklahoma and in the Southern Plains to having some demand to offset uh, the uh, normal fall run of calves that we have uh, in Oklahoma. And there's other issues out there as well that are playing into this so that we'll talk about briefly, the drought and, uh, and some other things like that. Here's another way to graph those. So uh, the green line at the top was the uh, prices by weight from 375 to 925 pound steers. These are Oklahoma auction average prices. 
And so you can see where we were uh, the ninth, the week of the 9th of October. The blue line is a week later, the 16th of October, and the red line was uh, the most recent week that I have dated for, uh, which ended the 23rd of October. And you can see that, uh, you know, a couple of things are, are notable here. One is that these calf prices over here, the four and five weights really didn't change all that much, uh, at least up to about 550 pounds. They really stayed pretty similar uh, through that time period and the price is declining fairly rapidly. So there's a fairly big rollback uh, as you put weight on those cattle at that point. That affects the value of gain. It affects things like, uh, you know, what you would expect to see in returns if you did keep calves and put an extra 50 pounds on them. Uh, beyond weaning before you sold them, those kinds of things. At about 600 pounds, uh, this happens almost every fall in Oklahoma, we begin to see a break where this line flattens out. And it was most pronounced this last week when the dry conditions really weighed on the markets um, and combined with the, again, the normal increase in, uh, in numbers. And so we see from about 600 pounds to about uh, almost uh, 850 pounds, there's really not much difference in price. Very little rollback. That's a high value of gain if you're putting weight on cattle through that range at this point in time. Um, and so again, it has implications. This could be very close to the fall low, this red line, or we may see a little bit lower prices yet this, uh, this week um, that we're actually recording this. Uh, we had a big storm early in the week. I wouldn't be surprised if these prices aren't a little bit lower this week, but then with the moisture that we've received, I think there's a fair chance that might be the low and we begin to increase a little bit. So within a couple of weeks, we'll know whether any of that uh, pans out that way, but that's kind of the way it looks to me at this moment. We look at the fed cattle markets. Uh, again, lots of volatility, tremendous uh, uh, ups and downs in the first half of the year. And we did create this big backlog of fed cattle in April and May uh, with the uh, slaughter plants uh, closed down or, or greatly reduced in capacity. And so those uh, extra animals uh, took many weeks to work through the market and that really weighed on the fed cattle market in July and August. We have recovered some since then. And, uh, you know, again, generally, um, now most recently we've seen those prices erode a little bit here in the fall. Uh, we're running about 103, 104 right now um, and, and trying to hold steady, maybe even pick up uh, a dollar or so here right at the end of October uh, in this fed cattle market. Box beef cut out, you know, again, we had this enormous spike because of restricted supplies and production of beef for a, about an eight or nine week period in April and May. That caused this enormous spike. It went up very rapidly, it came down very rapidly and, and right back to, you know, previous levels. Um, we're gonna see in just a minute that beef production has been at or above year ago level since uh, late May. And, uh, and so box beef prices, kind of back where they were, at times a little bit better than last year. Uh, most recently, we've seen those prices erode a little bit. It's kind of hard to see the, the uh, recent price action simply because the scale of this graph was so messed up by the big spike we had in April and May, uh, but uh, makes it a little bit more of a challenge to see kind of the short-term dynamics we've been seeing in the last couple of weeks. Cull cow prices um, were remarkably strong through the summer. Um, and that's kind of normal uh, peak time of the year. Cold cow prices typically peak in April and May. Um, and so it's not that surprising. We had strong demand for cold cows relative to a year ago, at least, uh, through the summer. Um, part of that was the fact that uh, we did have lots of heavy carcasses that produced a lot of 50% trimmings, the kind of thing you need a lot of lean meat from cold cows to mix with in the ground beef market. And we did see relatively more recovery in the, uh, the quick service restaurants. So the fast food chains, the hamburger places recovered uh, relatively more than other parts of the food service sector. And so that really kind of uh, supported this demand. Now in the fall of the year, we typically see very pronounced seasonal fall lows for cull cows. And, and certainly we've seen that seasonal pressure uh, here. And we're, and we're probably not quite done with that. We probably will we'll get into uh, close to Thanksgiving before we see the, the peak in that, uh, or the, the bottom really, um, the peak decline, if you will, uh, seasonally for these uh, cull cow prices. Typically then we see a very sharp recovery after the first of the year, from January to February to March, those prices will typically go up 15 to 20% um, at that time of the year. Okay, the feedlot situation, 
again, you see the enormous disruption in April and May. We couldn't market cattle out of the feedlots. The packing plant simply could not take them at that time. And so, uh, you know, we did catch up in, in June, July, August, and September. We're running at uh, most of the time, or, uh, you know, most recently in September, a little bit above year ago levels. Um, and, and we're going to see here in just a minute that, again, I think we've dealt with the backlog, but it has, uh, has weighed on the market through much of this time period, creating lots of challenges to get these uh, back current. And I think feedlots really are current now. I think we uh, uh, don't have cattle that are seriously backlogged from when they really needed to be uh, marketed and, uh, and harvested. Uh, we're probably pretty, pretty current at this point. Feedlot placements were down in the first uh, four months of the year. Um, and then uh, in the last three months of the year, they've been well above year goal levels. And so again, lots of short-term dynamics. When you add all of these together for the whole year, placements are, are up less than 1%. So it's more a matter of the short-term timing than it is changing the overall numbers. Um, you know, none of this uh, created more cattle or took any cattle away from the situation. It just changed the timing as we've gone through the year. So, but these uh, last three months of large placements have given us a, a cattle on feed uh, going into October that was record large for that date, uh, for the data series, which goes back to 1996. So, uh, um, you know, instead of having the fall low that you see kind of in that red line, um, seasonal low and, and feedlot inventories, we really didn't have much of a low this year. We, uh, we pushed cattle off into there. And again, I think a lot of this is just really the residual ripples, if you will, of the dynamics from the first half of the year, uh, still playing out through the feedlot situation. Uh, we won't continue to see those large placements. We don't have more feeder cattle. I said earlier that uh, feeder numbers, uh, cattle numbers in general are starting to tighten up. So as we finish out the year and go into next year, uh, we'll pull this feedlot inventory back down to year ago levels and then below uh, as we go forward. So uh, we're just working through the, uh, the dynamics here. You can really see the impact of the backlog here. We calculate a number for cattle on feed over 120 days. Now this can happen for a couple of reasons. If we place a lot of lightweight cattle, they stay on feed longer. So you'll have more, more cattle on feed for more days. But this was a case of cattle that could not be marketed in April and May when the packing plants were shut down or restricted. We built up those numbers and you can see now by September, we had them back down to year goal level. So, Again, this is uh, indications that I think we have dealt with the backlog. Feedlots are pretty current, uh, although we're going to see that the cattle are still big and the carcass weights are still big, but it's not because the cattle are really backed up at this point. Um, I think we have moved, moved past that. Adding to all of the COVID dynamics this year has been the, uh, you know, the emerging and continuing uh, drought situation in the U.S. And, and this has generally gotten worse through the summer. Uh, Oklahoma got a little better in midsummer and then went backwards and got worse again um, in, into the fall. Uh, but in general, in the West, we've got a lot of very dry conditions. This has forced some uh, early uh, movement of feeder cattle. Some of those feedlot placements that we just saw probably were the result of feeder cattle that really just had to go somewhere. So they ended up in the feedlot. We've probably also seen some uh, cow marketings as a result of this. <coughs> cow culling, uh, we will see in just a minute, is above a year ago. I don't think the majority of it is really due to drought, but it is certainly part of it, and, and in some regions, clearly, uh, is, <coughs> is part of the impact. Oklahoma specifically, <coughs> up until this last week, uh, had, a, again, an expanding drought area. Um, Weather conditions in the southern part of the U.S. have followed pretty classic La Nina conditions through the fall up until this last week. And, and uh, the reason we didn't have this seminar live uh, earlier this week was because of the massive uh, Arctic uh, air mass that moved in uh, with a lot of precipitation with it that came in many different forms. Unfortunately, uh, right around uh, the central Oklahoma here, uh, we had significant ice accumulations, lots of tree damage, lots of power outages, uh, which are still being dealt with here towards the end of the week. Uh, in some areas, it was more rain. In some areas, it was snow. Uh, in some areas, it was freezing rain or sleet. And so, uh, but when you look at it all together, and this may not capture some of the residual frozen precip, but I think it has most of it. 
this map as of, uh, as of today, October 29th, uh, shows that uh, the vast majority of the state has gotten anywhere from two to five inches of rain. This is going to be a major uh, shot in the arm, if you will, for wheat. We had a lot of wheat that was planted and emerged, but was getting extremely dry. This should, uh, should really help that, depending on what the weather does from here on. This may uh, kind of revive our uh, winter stocker, winter grazing prospects a little bit uh, going forward. We just have to kind of wait and see how this plays out. But we did not anticipate this. This was kind of an intrusion into our La Nina weather pattern uh, from, from the Arctic that um, you know probably we can't count on uh, continuing, but at least it came at a very uh, timely uh, uh, date in terms of the wheat pasture situation. Steer slaughter, again, you see the massive disruption in April and May, but since then we've been running at or above year ago levels. Um, and so, you know, the recovery in the processing industry was actually quite remarkable. The disruption was, was enormous, unprecedented, use whatever superlative you want. Uh, we've never seen anything like that, and yet the industry really did come back remarkably fast and, and begin to slaughter those additional animals. So Cumulatively for the year, steer and heifer slaughter are down nearly 4%, but they're converging on year ago levels. We've got about 10 more weeks of data to finish out 2020. And I think we'll see these numbers continue to converge on last year's levels. They'll still be down a little bit at the end of the year, but they won't be down as much even as they show here. Uh, dairy cow slaughter is down 5%. Beef cow slaughter has been above year ago levels uh, all year for the most part. Um, uh, certainly has averaged that. We're still running almost 3% above year ago levels, but it's converging to last year's levels from above. And so by the end of the year, we'll be down closer to 2% year over year increase in beef cow slaughter. So when it's all said and done, total slaughter, uh, which is currently down 3.4% for the year to date, will probably end up down about 2% uh, across steers, heifers, cows, and bulls uh, by the time we get to the end of the year. Be a little bit lower, and certainly, again, we'll look for it to be uh, lower again even next year. Part of what has offset lower cattle slaughter across the board um, has been heavier carcass weights. Steer carcass weights shown here were above year go levels at the beginning of the year. They started out big. They didn't have much of a seasonal low because that's when we backed cattle up in the feedlots. And so they stayed heavy and got heavier than they would have. Uh, and then, of course, they've stayed heavy this fall. Uh, we're going to set new records this fall for uh, carcass weights seasonally and for an annual average. Uh, these steer carcasses will average over 900 pounds for the first time ever this year. And so that has partially offset the overall reductions in slaughter and kept the uh, beef reduction uh, a little bit uh, closer to last year's levels. Um, it was up in the first quarter, down in the second quarter, and has been running slightly above in the third and, and so far in the fourth quarters and we'll finish out the year that way. So when it's all said and done, um, you know, we're gonna have beef production for 2020. So look over here on the left side, 2020 beef production will be up slightly close to half a percent uh, year over year uh, when it's all said and done. Um, next year, we're looking for about a one and a half percent decrease. And again, that reflects uh, continuing tighter numbers. Probably we will see carcass weights pull back a little bit from this year's levels, at least on an annual average basis. And so the, the combination of those two things uh, will, uh, uh, will contribute to some decreases. From a demand standpoint, we also look at the other meats. So we've had lots of pork this year, uh, three plus percent additional pork in 2020, looking for uh, less growth, uh, but still uh, increases year over year in 2021. Poultry production up this year, perhaps not up very much next year, but the bottom line is we continue to set, as we have for the last several years, uh, new records for total meat production in the U.S. Uh, every year. This year will be a new record. Next year we'll push that a little bit higher yet. And so we've got lots of meat. That's one of the things you watch from a beef demand standpoint. Obviously competing meats and the prices of those meats are important. And then beyond that, we're looking at the overall macroeconomic conditions. So unemployment, uh, Unemployment without additional stimulus going forward is a, a greater uh, you know, prospect for weakness in demand than it has been so far where we've had quite a bit of various forms of stimulus and support for consumers 
up to this point. So we'll see what happens going forward um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, whatever kinds of policies might be forthcoming uh, as we go through, through the winter and into next year. So all of those factors are gonna matter in terms of looking at domestic demand um, as we look forward. But again, the supply picture begins to tighten a little bit going into 2021. That alone will be somewhat supportive relative to everything else. I'm gonna talk quickly just for a few minutes about the global beef market situation. Obviously COVID has been a global, it is a pandemic, it's affected the whole world, uh, continues to, and so we have lots of uncertainty about what those impacts might be going forward. Um, there have certainly been impacts thus far, uh, arguably maybe not as much as I would have anticipated, um, but they certainly could, uh, they will continue and they, and they could even get uh, more pronounced going forward. USDA's latest estimates for beef production globally shows far right side that US is the biggest, continues to be the biggest beef producer. Brazil, not too far away in second place, and then the EU, then China, and so on, as you look at these, uh, these uh, major beef producing countries around the world. We look at exports, Brazil by quite a bit is the largest beef exporting country in the world. But uh, if you see the actual numbers behind these, these forecasts have the U.S. just a little bit above Australia to be number two if they, uh, if they actually turn out this way. Um, doesn't really matter whether we're a close two or, or close three, um, but the bottom line is the U.S. has continued to grow for uh, quite a few years. We were typically the number four beef exporting country, and now we're flirting with being the number two uh, beef exporting country. Australia's right there. India's uh, number four and then you see Argentina, New Zealand, and so on uh, as you look at these. These are early forecasts for 2021, and so you know, they will no doubt uh, get modified as, as time goes on, but this is the way it looks at this point in time. On the import side, for many, many years, the U.S. was the biggest beef exporting country in the world. We were surpassed about two or three years ago by China, which has continued to expand dramatically. So China, this is mainland China data, by far and away now is the biggest beef importing country. Realistically, um, you could also add Hong Kong to that uh, because there's less and less distinction between those now than there once was. So you could add that to it and, and, and by an even bigger margin make uh, China slash Hong Kong the biggest beef importing uh, country by a lot and, and certainly is the major driver in global beef trade uh, when it comes to that. Japan's the number three and South Korea, both of these countries are our number one and two beef exporting, and we'll see in just, just a minute. We look at beef exports for the U.S. specifically. Again, dropped off in May and June, we simply didn't make the product, and so we couldn't export it, but we did recover pretty nicely in July and even better in August, and we'll probably finish out the year. Uh, overall, I think we'll be, we'll be down for the year, but we should be better here as we finish out the year and, and, and sort of finish strong barring some sort of major change in the economic slash public health situation uh, globally and, and certainly among our major markets. So as I said, Japan is our number one market. South Korea has grown to become a pretty close number two in recent years. Mexico has been our number three market but has dropped dramatically this year. Um, and so, uh, and then Canada and uh, Hong Kong reported separately is our number four market. Uh, China mainland is not one of our major markets, but you can see that it has grown dramatically. Uh, it still only represents this latest month's data here. That one month alone, it represented about 4% of our total exports. So it's still a pretty minor market, but if it continues to grow with the way that it has been for the last uh, almost a year now, it really started at the end of last year, uh, China could be a, a major U.S. beef export market in the next uh, two to four years if we continue to see that growth. I don't think I put the chart in here that showed just how much China has grown in recent years, but it's been absolutely dramatic uh, in terms of their total beef imports, most of which has not come from the U.S. or even from North America, but we're, we're, we're going to get into that market in, in a little bigger way. Beef imports spiked up in July. I think that was hamburger demand largely. Uh, driven uh, and the sort of residual effects of the disruption in production in May and June or April and May, excuse me. Uh, but really we had a lot of hamburger demand. We had a lot of need for lean to support those big carcass trimmings. And so we 
we pulled in that meat in, uh, in July. It won't stay, it's coming back down. It was a temporary kind of a market response. I think it will uh, we'll end the year up. As we can see, we're up about 11.5% through August of this year. Um, you know, historically, Australia was our biggest, uh, but uh, actually Canada last year was our biggest import market, followed by Australia. Uh, Mexico, number three, and then New Zealand. Uh, Brazil represents about 5% of our total uh, imports. So uh, again, some, some, there, some in increases there. We've seen dramatic growth from Mexico, uh, some from New Zealand. New Zealand was shipping more meat to China, but uh, this past few months has been shipping more meat, uh, diverting that back to the U.S. Uh, with some of the disruptions they've had with, uh, with the China market. So in a big picture sense, um, you know, over here we've got, uh, we had to lower our expectations, certainly from where we started the year, uh, for what we expected prices on average to be in 2020. At this point, we are still cautiously optimistic that we will see some increase in these prices in 2021 and, and 2022. I think realistically, you have to have a really big uh, sort of question mark around that. There's just an awful lot of things that could change that given that we are in the midst yet of this uh, pandemic and all of the, uh, the ongoing and cumulative effects that may be associated with that. But with the supply situation so supportive and demand thus far, both domestically and internationally, staying as strong as it has, um, there's reasons to have some optimism for prices in general uh, in 2021 and 2022. Now we've already pulled these forecasts back a little bit. So this is definitely a stay tuned kind of a thing. Uh, obviously, 2020, 2020 started from being a year when we expected modest increases in prices to uh, not turning out that way. And that could happen again, certainly in 2021. But uh, so it, it's, uh, it, there are just so many of these big picture kinds of things that could impact the market. The cattle market itself is in fairly good fundamental shape, but it all hinges on that demand and that's the big unknown. As we as we go forward, so that said, um, this is my uh, email address. Um, if you're interested in getting uh, some market comments uh, and some production uh, articles every week, you can uh, drop me an email and say you'd like to get the Calcalf Corner newsletter. I do that with Glenn Selk over in Animal Science. Uh, many of you know him, uh, and uh, if you'd like to get that, you can sure let me know. Um, and, and we'd be happy to put you on the list to get that newsletter. Otherwise, if you just have any questions or want to contact me, feel free to, uh, to follow up with me at this uh, email address. So with that, Brent, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Pill. Uh, please uh, join us for our next webinar on November 17th. It will be an Ag Finance Update with Dr. Rodney Jones giving the financial outlook for the Southern Plains agriculture. Um, thanks again and enjoy this recording. And in all of the emails I send out to share this recording, I will have a link to this, the uh, survey for feedback. And so thank you everyone.